Welcome everyone to this Saturday evening webinar on a global scale. To take the proceedings forward, let me first introduce Dr. Komal Chavan. She is the medical director at Chavan Maternity and Nursing Home, honorary professor at Dr. RN Cooper Hospital, chairperson for the Foxy Medical Disorders in Pregnancy Committee, Foxy, member, managing council, MOGS, and joint secretary, ISOPAB, Mumbai chapter, among many other laurels. Dr. Komal Chavan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. And I welcome you all on behalf of Foxy Medical Disorders in Pregnancy Committee and welcome you all for this international e-conclave on hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. And as a chairperson of medical disorders in pregnancy, we have been discussing so many medical disorders and hypertensive disorders in pregnancy is de definitely a leading problem in our country as well as globally. And we really need more and more insight how to diagnose it as early as possible so as to reduce the complications caused by it. And for this, we have planned an interesting program with eminent speakers. And actually, it's really a special day for me uh, because the guest of honor, there are, there are many mentors and senior teachers among all the esteemed faculties for the today's webinar. Dr. C.N. Purandari, who is kind enough to be the guest of the chief guest. The guest lecture is none other than by Dr. Patrick O'Brien from RCOG London. And an interesting panel with Dr. Hema Divakar, Dr. Suchitra Pandit, Dr. Krishnan Gupta and Archana Paseer, and the moderator of this webinar, Dr. Niranjan Chavan. So this is definitely a real milestone and a a great uh, uh, work by this committee and we are definitely trying to uh, spread the knowledge about the recent advances of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. And I welcome you all for this webinar and I would like to now call upon the chief guest for today, Dr. C.N. Purandare. And uh, C.N. Purandare, sir, is well known all over the globe. The name Purandare is just enough, like he has been synonym to the icon of obstetrics and gynec for, the, for us India. We look up to sir and sir has been a very great teacher and a guide and a mentor. And he is the president Figo, immediate past president and president Foxy. He was a dean of the ICOG college, editor emeritus of journal of obstetrics and Guide, uh, uh, Gynec Society of India, and he has won numerous awards, a lifetime award from the Indian Fertility Society, lifetime award from uh, Foxy, and he has been a consultant, teacher, a mentor to all of us, and he has also had the Purandari's modification of the radical hysterectomy, so, so many laurels in SIRS. Uh, cap and he has been a guiding force for all of us. He has been really uh, uh, a force to reckon with and we are really proud of his achievements. So, sir, I uh, over to you, sir, and please uh, bless us with your pearls of wisdom. And uh, I also request at the end to inaugurate a small book which we have uh, launched on the same topic that is the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Over to you, sir. Sir, so, uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you very much, Komal, for um, the generous introduction. Um, you, have, you yourself have been doing a fantastic job as uh, the uh, chair of uh, the Medical Disorders Committee. And um, uh, Foxy needs uh, dynamism from many of the committee chairs and uh, so on, so that um, the progress continues to happen. And then I'm really uh, happy to see the way, even in COVID era, um, Foxy has progressed so well, uh, of course, um, the dynamic leadership of Alpesh and the entire team. And all of you have put in so much effort in uh, uh, getting this uh, forward. And the ICOG team as well, which is the... Um, the teaching arm of uh, uh, Foxy, and we have Krishnendu here, who has been the uh, past chair and um, has contributed in a large uh, manner to the ICOG as the chair of uh, the ICOG. Uh, hypertension is one of the difficult subjects which we have always uh, had to grapple with uh, as obstetricians, and. Um, 
um, it's uh, even though um, this is something which, uh, as obstetricians, uh, we have always doubled ourselves as physicians to deal with it on all aspects of hypertension. Uh, if you go abroad, most of the times it is the physician who takes over and with uh, problems that are happening in the renal functions and whatever that happens in hypertension. Well, here, um, if you go uh, all over in the rural area of uh, India, uh, the obstetricians have to deal with everything. And it is really a challenge at times uh, when the um, investigations and infrastructure is not enough for them to deal with uh, what the situation is. The world is progressing very quickly and very fast, and you can see the uh, NCD committee of uh, FIGO, which has done so much work on hypertension in the pregnancy. You have the HAP1 guidelines, and now they have put forward the HAP2 um, suggested uh, recommendations, um, uh, which, are, which may be ideal in circumstances and may not be most ideal for uh, the underdeveloped areas, but still the 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 fact remains that uh, the if and when um, the um, you have the facilities to go ahead and look into the depth of the issues and find and diagnose early, uh, it, it's worthwhile when you're looking at the hypertension and. Uh, um, in UK, uh, uh, Pat will um, agree with me that um, uh, Nicolaitis has done so much work on the uterine artery flow and the role of um, uh, the aspirin, 150 milligrams to be given um, right from the beginning to make sure that those who are likely to get um, the preeclampsia uh, uh, are able to be taken right up to 37 weeks um, by giving uh, aspirin right from the beginning and the start so that um, you um, make sure that the survival of the baby is uh, better and um, uh, quality survival rather than uh, taking the risk of prematurity and so on and so forth. So it, it's something which um, uh, science is advancing and I think we all need to really imbibe the um, uh, knowledge and I'm happy to see uh, my dear friend Pat here um, who's now um, congratulations to you as one of the vice presidents of RCOG um, uh, to give a talk and uh, uh, the panel discussion also where you, we have all the eminent people there so I wish you all the very best Komal and um, I'm, I'm sure you will take it forward with uh, many other uh, webinars and as you have done before so so that by the time uh, you finish your uh, tenure as uh, the chair the next chair will have a difficult time to match up with you um, the work that you have done as the chair of the uh, medical disorders committee so all the very best to all of you and uh, good luck thank you Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. And really, your words are a great inspiration and it keeps motivating us. And uh, as I said, please uh, share the book which we want to launch from the auspicious act and from Dr. Sian Purandari, sir. And I would also like Patrick O'Brien to join, sir, to launch this book on hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, uh, edited by myself along with Dr. Niranjan Chavan. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Hima Madam. Thank you, everybody, for witnessing this uh, launch on the digital platform because we have we can't meet. And I'm really happy that uh, everybody, uh, my mentors, my teacher, Hima Madam, Suchitra Madam, Krishnendu Sir, Arch Archana Madam, all are witness to this uh, launch. And definitely, uh, we I am looking forward for, for this copy of the book in my hand too. This is a digital la launch. And I would also like to acknowledge and thank Dr. Alpesh Gandhi, President of Foxy, 
Dr. Jagdeep Tang, Secretary General and the Vice President in charge for my committee, Dr. Atul Ganatra. They have been really uh, encouraging and supportive throughout my journey as a chairperson of FOXI. And uh, with this uh, words, now we move forward for Dr. Patrick's talk. And uh, I would like to call Dr. Niranjan Chavan, uh, who is the moderator for the day. And before that, I would like to thank the partners for today's program, TOG Team, Science Integra, they have been definitely going everywhere with us, supporting and distributing science in all corners of India, along with, uh, along with our sponsors for today, the MQR, the Team MQR. And now I call upon Dr. Niranjan Chavan, uh, who is a professor and a unit chief at Sion Hospital, joint treasurer elect of FOXI, national coordinator for the committee. Uh, he was also the chairperson of FOXI Oncology and Trophoblastic Tumor Committee, vice president of Mumbai Obstetrics and Gynac Society, scientific secretary of AFG, and dean chairman of ECOG, chief editor of AFG Times, course coordinator of MUHS certified course of uh, minimally access surgery and infertility, and also has conducted many batches of advanced minimally access gynec surgery courses at Sion Hospital and at High Grad. Over to you, Dr. Niranjan Chavan. Thank you, Dr. Komal Chavan, for uh, introducing me. The Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists is a professional body based in London, United Kingdom. And the beauty of this college is that it has got more than 16,000 members in over 100 countries. And the best part is nearly 50% of these members are residing outside the British Isles. Isn't it such a wonderful thing that today, on such an important day, we have with us the Vice President of RCOG joining us virtually and that's none other than Dr. Patrick O'Brien. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Patrick O'Brien today to this international e-conclave on hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. What a day it is. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have two of the best men, of course, we have the third man also there and myself, but they are the most renowned ones of their own associations in the field of gynecology. We have FIGO on one side, we have RCOG on the other side. And I take this opportunity also to welcome Dr. C. N. Purandare, sir. Dr. Patrick O'Brien will be joined along with me and esteemed panelists who will be there the most classy and the elegant Dr. Hema Divakar, Madam from Bangalore, the most beautiful and poignant personality, Dr. Suchitra Pandit from Mumbai, and the complete man, I can say, Krishnendu Gupta from East, Kolkata. The Britishers came to India not through the gateway of India of Mumbai, but through Kolkata. And we have, from the central part of India, the best greeneries you can find and the windy and the lakes with none other than Archana Basair, who is going to join us from Indore. So I take this privilege and I hand over the mic to Dr. Patrick O'Brien. He is a professor at the University College London Hospital. As you are aware, he is a vice president of RCOG. He has been there on many, many books and he has been cited in many publications. He is specialist in maternal medicine and high-risk obstetrics. And we have seen him in India. Thank you, Dr. Patrick. I know it's been a very hectic week this, this uh, last weekend of January and you have made it. And I'm really thankful to you for that wonderful uh, presence of yours in virtually for India. So please go ahead with your lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Naranjan. It's a pleasure to be here. It would be a much greater pleasure to be there in person, but I hope that happens at some stage again in the future. But it's great to see all of my friends virtually, as you say. 
Now, let me just share my slides. I hope you can see and, and hear me okay. Can you? Yes, yes, yes. You can see. Fantastic. Okay. So I'm going to talk about recent advances in both the diagnosis and management of hypertension in pregnancy. And I think there's a temptation to think that nothing ever changes in preeclampsia. This is probably the first condition you learned about as a medical student the first time you came into your, your maternity unit. Uh, and it seems that it never changes, it goes on. But actually, in the last few years, there have been quite a few innovations and changes in, in preeclampsia. So I start with diagnosis and then talk about uh, management and, and so on. So in fact, a few years ago, the ISSHP, the International Society for the Study of Hypertension in Pregnancy, really good society, well worth joining if you're interested in preeclampsia and gestational hypertension. So they decided that it's not enough to have the traditional diagnostic criteria, the proteinuria, hypertension, etc., not enough, because it's missing too many women and babies that come to grief from these conditions. And they decided it's important to start including end organ damage, whether that's in the mother or in the fetus stroke placenta. So their up updated guidelines say, yes, you need hypertension after 20 weeks, but any one of the following, either proteinuria or other maternal organ dysfunction, kidneys, liver, neurological, hematological, uh, or uteroplacental dysfunction, in other words, fetal growth restriction. So note that you no longer need proteinuria for the diagnosis of preeclampsia. You can have hypertension with one of the other manifestations. And that's an important change. And what difference does that make? Well, it actually improves the identification of adverse outcomes. So these are the different cri diagnostic criteria. So you've got hypertension plus traditionally just proteinuria, American College, all of any of these things, ISSHP, I was just talking about any of these things, and ISSHP plus angiogenic imbalance. Now, I'll talk a bit more about that later in my talk. What difference does that make? Well, it makes quite a difference. If you look, for example, the black bars here are for traditional diagnosis, the light blue, the ACOG, the darker blue, ISSHP, and the red, ISSHP plus angiogenic imbalance. And you will see for a range of bad outcomes for mother and baby that the, the different uh, diagnostic criteria actually are much better at predicting and detecting those people at greater risk of, of poor outcomes. So these diagnostic criteria matter. So I think it is well worth switching on to the ISSHP diagnostic criteria in this day and age. I will talk more about angiogenic um, uh, markers in a minute. Okay, the new classification of hypertension in pregnancy. This is from the ISSHP, and this is just 2018. Uh, and just, you know, a lot of it's similar, of course, but a few bits and pieces that are different, which I'll talk about now. So, of course, it's divided into hypertension before pregnancy or before 20 weeks, and hypertension arising for the first time after 20 weeks. So in the first group, the pre-pregnancy or less than 20 weeks, you've got chron chronic hypertension, which we're all familiar with, white coat hypertension, which we're pretty familiar with, mass hypertension, maybe a little bit less familiar with that. And then after 20 weeks, gestational hypertension, uh, transient gestational hypertension, which I'll talk about in one minute, and preeclampsia, of course. So white coat hypertension, as you know, is when somebody has high blood pressure when you see them in your clinic or your office, but their blood pressure is normal at home. Mass hypertension is almost the opposite. It's blood pressure that's normal when you see them in your clinic, but is elevated at other times, and typically diagnosed by a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or home blood pressure monitoring. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, and this is important because, um, you know, it, it suggests that people get high blood pressure at certain times during the day, and when they happen to come to your clinic and you saw them, the blood pressure just happened to be fine at that time. So what's this transient gestational hypertension? Well, that's somebody where they come in, you check their blood pressure, a bit high, you retest it after a while, and it settles down. Now, traditionally, we have ignored that. We said, oh, she was just a bit stressed, or she ran up the stairs, or I kept her waiting so she's annoyed with me. But in fact, it's not as benign as you might think, because we know from good trials now that about 20% of these women will go on to develop preeclampsia, and a further 20% will go on to develop gestational hypertension. So... Don't ignore this when you see people's blood pressure up and down a little bit. They should be monitored more closely, including, ideally, home blood pressure monitoring. Home blood pressure monitoring, the ISSHP said in 2018, checking these things at home 
is really valuable because it distinguishes white coat hypertension, it distinguishes mast hypertension. And you can do home blood pressure monitoring, I'll talk about that in a second. And of course you can do home proteinuria monitoring, you know, if you've got a, an automated system, fantastic. But it's easy enough to have this bottle like the little one on the, on the right there, which we all have in our clinics. You, it takes a minute to teach somebody how to check their own protein at home. And why does this matter? Well, it matters because up to a quarter of women who have high blood pressure when you see them will have white coat hypertension. Uh, and therefore, unless you do home blood pressure monitoring or 24 hour, hour uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and just treat them on the basis of their blood pressure that you checked in their clinic, you will be over treating a lot of people. Uh, and does this matter? Well, it does. Look at this. This is comparing home blood pressure monitoring, which is the hatched uh, blocks, with uh, monitoring in your antenatal clinic or your office, which are the white blocks. This is for systolic blood pressure. And you can see that every single gestation, blood pressure is lower at home when checked at home than it is in the office. And the same applies to diastolic blood pressure. Does that matter? Well, it does. Because when it comes to diagnosing clinically significant hypertension, what do I mean? Well, I mean hypertension that you would normally start treatment for, or if, one, if a woman's already on treatment, that you would increase the treatment. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you look at that, with home blood pressure monitoring, it's only a few percent of women uh, meet those criteria for treatment or increasing treatment, <clears throat> whereas it's, it's a lot more if you rely on your clinic blood pressure reading. And you can see that those measures are statistically significant. This is a nice paper just two years ago. Um, this is a nice uh, home blood pressure monitoring app, and I'll immediately declare an interest here. It's been developed by my wife, Professor Asma Khalila, maternal fetal medicine specialist. So this is an app that anybody can download onto their machine. It, it does link into a hospital-based system as well, so that what happens is the, mother, the woman checks her blood pressure and urine at home. She enters the value into this app, uh, and the app links to the hospital. But more importantly, perhaps, the app tells her what to do. This app has won a series of awards that you can see at the bottom from the Health Service Journal, the British Medical Journal, and so on. And basically, the app tells you, you know, if your blood pressure is high, you should sit quietly for a few minutes and recheck it. If it's not any better, you should go to the hospital. Or if it's in the yellow bar, if your blood pressure is high normal, you should rest for a bit, check it again. If it settles, fine, but keep monitoring your blood pressure. So basically, the app tells you what to do, uh, including directing you to hospital when, when appropriate. And this has really come into its own during the COVID pandemic for very obvious reasons. I mean, you're, uh, you're as aware as I am that, you know, this traditional um, schedule of antenatal visits, you know, every four weeks, then every two weeks, then every week, the main driver behind the increased frequency of visits towards the end is watching out for preeclampsia. And we realized very rapidly in COVID that it seemed absolutely silly to have women coming into hospital every week, hanging around in a busy antenatal clinic just to have their blood pressure urine and urine done when they could do it perfectly well at home. Uh, and the government put a large amount of money into purchasing a huge number of home blood pressure monitoring uh, and recommending various apps. And we, when we were writing our first um, early guidance on COVID in pregnancy in the RCOG, back in the end of March, you can see, uh, we produced this, which was about, about that very topic. Now, who to monitor? Well, during the pandemic, we thought, well, the priority is group one here. It's women who already have high blood pressure, whether that's chronic or, or new blood pressure in pregnancy. But, you know, there's a case as, as the resources supporting this evolve for um, following group two, which are basically women whose blood pressure is normal, but are at increased risk of preeclampsia. And then maybe in due course, all women, because it is crazy, I think, for women to be coming all the way up to hospital just to have their blood pressure and urine tested when they could easily be doing it at home. It saves so much money, so much unwasted travel for the woman, so much hanging around in hospital waiting clinics, um, and also tends to put their blood pressure up, as we've just been explaining. Just to mention that this hasn't changed. The accepted threshold at any gestation for high blood pressure is 140 over 90. This is the NICE guidance from back in 2010, and that hasn't changed. This is a, a nice paper looking at white coat hypertension. I just wanted to spend a minute on that because people tend to think of white coat hypertension 
as being a benign con condition. It's just the woman's blood pressure comes up when she comes to see me in the hospital or my clinic. She's just a bit stressed, but it's fine the rest of the time. Yes, that's true, but it's not as benign as you might think. So if you look at the, on the left here, you compare white coat hypertension versus those women who are normal tensive. Actually, white coat hypertension is associated with a five times higher risk of developing preeclampsia, two and a half times more risk of getting small for gestational age, and three times the chance of having preterm birth, usually atrogenic for blood pressure. Um, having said that, it's not as bad. White coat hypertension, not as bad as gestational hypertension. So compared to gestational hypertension, if you've got white coat hypertension, your chances of getting preeclampsia is about half, SGA about half, preterm birth about half. So to, to summarize that, it's a really nice um, meta-analysis of all these data. White coat hypertension is worse than being normal tensive, of course, but it's better than having gestational hypertension or chronic hypertension. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to now screening and prevention of preeclampsia. And these are the NICE guidelines, which incidentally have been updated just last year. Uh, and they have moderate risk factors and high risk factors, all based on characteristics of the woman herself. So a bit limited, a bit restricted, it has to be said. So the moderate ones you're, you're familiar with, the first pregnancy, age, BMI, etc. The high risk ones, pre, uh, hypertension during previous pregnancy or pre-existing kidney disease, autoimmune disease, diabetes, etc. So you're all familiar with those. And the guidance from 2019 is that you qualify as, in, as being at increased risk of uh, preeclampsia if you have any one of the high risk factors or two or more of the medium risk factors. And those are the women that qualify for getting aspirin from 12 weeks until delivery. Now, Professor Nicolaides, Kipper Nicolaides, whom you'd all uh, know very well, thought, well, he thought, well, that reminds me of the old days when we were screening for Down syndrome based on the woman's age alone and just how poor that was at screening for Down syndrome. Uh, and in fact, he's, he's right in the sense that if you look at the NICE guidance, it would classify about 40% of all women as being at increased risk of preeclampsia, whose theory is not, not correct. So he determined a model for working out the risk of preeclampsia that was quite similar for the model that he used for uh, detecting the risk of Down syndrome. In other words, starting with the maternal history, like the mother's age when it comes to Down syndrome, adding in biophysical markers like ultrasound and blood test, uh, ultrasound results, uh, and adding in biochemical markers. So in the, in the uh, instance of Down syndrome, those, those uh, combined tests, for example. And putting all of those together to work out an adjusted and hopefully much more accurate risk of Down syndrome. And he argued that you should be able to do the same with the risk of preeclampsia. And he's done that very effectively. So on the left here, you see the biophys the maternal history factors that we were just talking about. And you can see that the, the older you are, the greater the, uh, the risk factor, the, the greater the multiplication factor, same with weight, ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these maternal history factors uh, start with your baseline risk. Then you add in the biophysical markers, which are uterine artery dopplers and the maternal blood pressure and they alter that starting risk. And then you add in PLGF, placental growth factor. So placental growth factor is a good thing. It's an angiogenic factor. So the, the lower your placental growth factor, the worse it is. And I'll talk about that again in, in a minute. And if you combine all three of those together, he has shown, Professor Nicolaides, that you will detect, so for a false positive rate of 10%, so these are the red bars, you will detect 95% of those women going to get preeclampsia before 34 weeks. 75% of those before 37 weeks, and only 50%, 52% of, of all preeclampsia. Now, in the, you know, you think, well, okay, that's not great when you get to the later gestations, but actually, it doesn't matter that much of the late, late gestations. The ones you really want to detect are the early preeclampsia, the ones with the, the worst outcome for mother and baby. So very interesting data and a really good model. Now, you might have thought, and for many years, people said, well, that's great, but what's the point? What's the point in working out at 12 weeks that somebody's at increased risk of preeclampsia when there's nothing you can do about it? Well, that all changed with the publication of the ASPRAY trial in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago, again from Nicolaides' group. 
So the study design, and, and CN uh, touched on this a second ago, um, the dose was 150 milligrams a day. Why? Well, there's some studies that suggest that at 81 milligrams, a lower dose, and 75, which we use here in the UK, that 30% of women are resistant to that, but only 5% resistant when you get up to doses of 160 milligrams. So that's why he chose 150 milligrams. Starting at 12 weeks, finishing at uh, 36 weeks, why to avoid potential hemorrhage for the neonates? I don't think that's valid. The CLASP trial, BLAST trial, a whole series of trials uh, suggested that there's no risk to the neonate, even if the woman has taken aspirin on the day of delivery. Um, ideally take it at night and not in the morning or during the day. And nice study from 2013 that showed you've got a lower incidence of preeclampsia, et cetera, et cetera, if you take the aspirin at night time. And the outcome in this aspirate trial was preterm preeclampsia. And the high-risk group, as defined by the, the, the Kippers Nicolaides, is a fetal medicine foundational algor algorithm that, that I was talking about. So they screened 27,000 women between 11 and 13 weeks. They found that uh, uh, nearly 3,000 of those were high-risk uh, for preterm preeclampsia. They randomized them, and they had 800 in each arm, 800 aspirin, 800 placebo. What did they find? Well, they found that low-dose aspirin in this dose, in this group of women, prevented or reduced by 82% the chances of getting preeclampsia under 34 weeks. A fantastic result. Reduced by 62% the chances of getting preeclampsia under 37 weeks, and only 5% in getting preeclampsia over 37 weeks. But again, as I said earlier, the, the people that really count are the people getting the earlier preeclampsia rather than the later one. Now, the ISSHP that I, I mentioned earlier, you know, if you haven't got all of this, um, um, the facility for PLGF, for example, or early uterine artery Doppler, they say that these women with strong clinical risk factors, preeclampsia, chronic hypertension, gestation diabetes, BMI, antiphospholipid syndrome, um, IVF, they should be treated ideally before 16 weeks with low-dose aspirin. From, as, as evidence in randomized controlled trials. It's worth showing that the ASPRE trial, or worth saying that the ASPRE trial said that in those in whom the aspirin was started after 15 weeks, there was no improvement in outcome. So really, it's got to be below 15 weeks and ideally earlier than that. While we're on the topic of prevention, <clears throat> then there's a question that quite commonly women are given uh, folic acid throughout pregnancy to prevent preeclampsia. A really good randomized trial of this, um, the, the FACT trial, it's called, published a couple of years ago. Two and a half thousand women randomized into getting folic acid or no folic acid. What was the result? Supplementation with folic acid after the first trimester, trimester makes no difference to the incidence of preeclampsia. So forget it, you're wasting your time. Okay, I'm going to move on to now the sometimes quite tricky decision about when to deliver in preeclampsia. I guess, in a sense, it's easy when somebody is after 37 weeks. You know, these are the criteria in the NICE guidelines and ISSHB, and it's not rocket science. If you develop repeated episodes of severe hypertension despite being on three drugs, if you get thrombocytopenia, that's progressive, increasing the abnormal liver, your, uh, your uh, renal function, pulmonary edema, neurological, or you're worried about the baby, of course, you would get on and deliver. deliver. That, that's not too difficult. But the tricky one is perhaps this. If you're between 34 and 37 weeks, what do you do? Do you try to press on a bit longer in the interest of gaining maturity for the baby? Or uh, do you deliver the baby in the interest of not letting the mother get worse? Well, here's a really good trial, the Phoenix trial, run by Lucy Chappell, Peter Brocklehurst, Andy Shannon, and their groups in, in London. And it was basically planned early delivery or planned expected management in that group of women between 34 and 37 weeks. So the slightly tricky group of women in whom to make this decision. So they randomized 450 where you just get on and deliver and 450 where you watch and wait for a bit. And their outcomes were, from the mother's point of view, a composite of maternal morbidity or high systolic blood pressure. From the baby's point of view, perinatal death or neonatal unit admission. So what do they find? So we look at the, the, the box, the, the, the chart on the left here. This is maternal outcome. It showed that if you got on and delivered uh, the baby soon, 
the mothers didn't have such bad outcomes. Whereas if you waited, the mothers were more likely to get worse. On the other hand, if you look at the outcome for the baby, if you got on and delivered the baby, the babies were likely to do a bit worse rather than if you kept the baby inside for a bit longer. So I guess in a sense, it's, it's more or less what we would have expected <clears throat> from a trial like this. But their conclusion from this study, this trial, was that if you get on and deliver the baby a bit earlier, that you reduce maternal morbidity and severe hypertension. Okay, you increase the chances of neonatal unit admission related to prematurity, <clears throat> but the babies actually didn't do any worse at the, uh, at the end of the day. So their suggestion, <clears throat> excuse me, was to get on and to, in, the, in this group of women, get on and deliver the baby. Now, of course, it depends a bit on your um, access to neonatal uh, unit uh, facilities and so on, but it's, it's a study well worth bearing in mind when you're making your decisions between 34 and 37 weeks. <clears throat> now, I'd said I'd come back to angiogenic factors, and I said that PLGF is a growth factor, it's a good thing, so low levels of uh, PLGF are, are bad. On the other hand, S-split-1 is an anti-angiogenic factor, so high, high levels of, of S-split-1 are, are bad. So how could you use this, first of all, in women with suspected preeclampsia? So the women that you're seeing day in, day out, they come in, blood pressure's up a little bit, a little bit of protein in the urine, does, does this woman have preeclampsia or not? Do these angiogenic factors help with working that out? So a very nice study, uh, again by Lucy Chappell and Andy Shannon, about the diagnostic, diagnostic uh, um, accuracy of placental growth factor in these women with suspected preeclampsia. And what did they find? Well, they found that low PLGF, and I remember I said that's a bad thing. First of all, look at the specificity over on the right. So uh, that's pretty good at all gestations. But if you look at this red box over here, the sensitivity, the chances of picking up those requiring delivery within the next two weeks for preeclampsia, not bad under 35 weeks, but over 35 weeks, pretty useless. So how might this uh, translate into clinical practice? Well, this is a suggested algorithm where if your PLGF is very low, less than 12, that's high risk for developing preeclampsia in the next couple of weeks, and therefore you should wa watch them closely and consider admission. If the PLGF is a bit low, between 12 and 100, these are moderate risks, so you might let them go home, but keep a closer eye on them. And if your PLGF is high, that's a good thing, that's a low-risk woman, and you can reassure them that the chances of them developing preeclampsia in the next couple of weeks is pretty low. So this is a useful tool for trying to distinguish those women that you're seeing, perhaps in your day assessment unit, in your clinic, you're not sure whether they need admission or delivery or not, this is quite a useful learning tool. Now, this is a really nice study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, predicting uh, these, uh, how these angiogenic factors might uh, help in this group of women. And they're using both, they're using both S1 and PLGF, so the ratio of them. And remember I said that high S1 is bad, low PLGF is bad. So the higher your ratio, the worse it is. So if you look at this chart on the left, first of all, specificity versus sensitivity, you can see that using this ratio, if it's low, then your negative predictive value is 99%. What does that mean? You're saying that if this is low, this value is low, and I'd, I'm saying to you, your chances of developing preeclampsia in the next week are low, that is 99% correct. On the other hand, if you look over here, if that ratio is high, in other words, a bad thing, actually the positive predictive value is only about a third. In other words, I, if I say to you, what are your chances based on this of getting preeclampsia within the next four weeks? It's only about a third. So based on those findings of a really good study, these are the nice guidance. And what do they say? It's best to use these angiogenic factors to rule out preeclampsia, not rule in. In other words, if it's negative, it's a good, if it's a good value, you say you're not going to get a preeclampsia in the next week, that's very accurate. But if it's a bad value from your angiogenic factors and you say to people, you're going to get preeclampsia in the next few weeks, that's very inaccurate. So use it to rule, rule out, not rule in. And as I showed earlier, much more accurate below 35 weeks, not very accurate after 35 weeks.
So that's all very well. That's saying that these angiogenic factors might help you in, in diagnosing preeclampsia, making an accurate diagnosis. But does it actually make a difference to pregnancy outcomes? Well, here's a very nice trial, the PARA trial, again from Lucy Chappell's group. Um, and looking at um, percentile growth factor uh, for women with suspected preeclampsia and whether it actually makes a difference to their outcome. So 1,000 women randomized to, so they all had P PLGF tested, but in half the, half the women, uh, the treating cl clinicians were told the, P the PLGF result. In the other half, the clinicians were not told the result of PLGF. So su suspected preeclampsia is the, the things that you all see every day of, of your working lives, new onset, hypertension, proteinuria, et cetera, and symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. The primary outcome is interesting, is the time from the presentation with suspected preeclampsia until the time that you make the diagnosis, this woman definitely has preeclampsia. And if you look at the chart on the, the left here, this is the time it took to make the diagnosis with certainty. So when people were told, when the doctors were told the PLGF result, it took two days. When the PLGF was not told, it took four days. Does that make a difference? Well, you think, well, not a huge difference, two days. But look, when it comes to bad maternal outcomes, severe adverse outcomes, when uh, the doctors knew the PLGF result, 4% of women uh, developed, uh, had a bad outcome, compared to 5% where the PLGF result was hidden. And this uh, difference was statistically significant. Note in the green bar at the bottom, no difference in outcomes for the baby, or interestingly enough, in gestation at, at delivery. So there was a bit of a difference, but not statistically significant. So they would argue, on the basis of this trial, a pretty good trial, it has to be said, that testing PLGF reduces the time to confirming the diagnosis. Does that make a difference? Not really. But also reduces the chances of poor maternal outcomes. Now, how do you translate that into, you know, how do you use that in practice? Well, this is what they've suggested. So, first of all, you treat women with blood pressure according to your normal protocols, mild, moderate, severe. And then you test the PLGF, and then you allow the result of the PLGF to influence your management a bit. So, if your PLGF is normal, the green box down here, you continue what you would normally be doing. If the PLGF is a bit low, you might consider increased surveillance compared to what you normally do. And if your PLGF is very low, you might assess these, you might monitor these people and consider admission as if they had preeclampsia. So you have your normal practice, but you modify it a bit depending on your PLGF result. And I'm not, of course, going to go through this, but I just put it up. This is from Webster et al., very nice publication in the British Medical Journal just last year, a really nice algorithm for managing hypertension in pregnancy based on the most recent evidence, all the stuff that I've been talking about. So you might want to consider incorporating or even just using that uh, in your own units. <clears throat> I just mentioned that the target blood pressure in pregnancy should be quite tight based on all of the evidence that we have now, including recent data. In other words, your target blood pressure should be no higher, diastolic, no higher than 85. So the algorithm is if your blood pressure diastolic, somewhere between 80 and 85, carry on. If it's less than 80, reduce or stop the medication on the basis that if you over-treat hypertension, you might reduce the blood flow through the uterine arteries, utero placental perfusion, and these babies often are at risk of growth restriction. So over-treating hypertension can uh, harm the baby. On the other hand, if the diastolic is above 85, treat. Increase the dose if they're already on medication or start something if they're not. Now, this is a really nice study. I really like this. This is from Laura McGee, published just uh, in 2020, two different publications. And it's a really nice algorithm, I think, about how to uh, step up your treatment of, of high blood pressure. Um, on the left here, you've got the, the standard antihypertensive labetalol, nafedipine, and methyl dopa. So the first thing to note is that this is the order that they're suggesting that you introduce the medication in. First, labetalol then nifedipine, then methyl double. And they're suggesting this. So you start with a low dose of nifedipine, of labetalol. If the blood pressure is not adequately controlled, go up to a medium dose. If it's not, not adequately controlled at that dose, don't go to the high dose. Come back and start a second antihypertensive at low dose. If you need more, 
medium dose of the second one. If you need more, don't go up to the high dose. Uh, come back here again and add in your third agent and so on. Why do you do that? You do that because of evidence that a combination of medications is better than a higher dose of one medication alone. And it's also better at getting less side effects. So higher dose of one is more likely to give you side effects than a combination of low or medium dose of others. So I think you can download, the, download this, you know, take a screenshot or get it from Laura McGee's papers. I think it's a really nice algorithm to stick to. I'll just touch on this little study, uh, aspirin in uh, twin specifically. Uh, and if you, I'm just going to focus on the, the red and the blue for one second. These are uh, women with twins at increased risk of preeclampsia. If you gave them 75 milligrams, 11% got uh, uh, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. If you gave them 150 milligrams, only 2% got it. So, you know, not fantastic evidence, but a suggestion that twin twins, uh, you should give the higher dose of aspirin. Ignore this. This is not a good comparative group. These are women who are not at increased risk of preeclampsia in the first place. So um, not a valid comparison with these other two groups. So that's a, a little um, study worth remembering. Now, I'm coming towards the end, but I want to talk about this. I've always found it a fascinating question. You know, when somebody gets preeclampsia in pregnancy, we've known for quite a while now that these women, you know, usually their blood pressure goes back to normal after delivery. But we know that these women, a little bit further down the line and later in life, are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So hypertension, stroke, ischemic heart disease, and so on. We've known that for a long time. Uh, and recent studies, including by David Williams, my colleague, have put, have put some accurate figures around that. And we've always asked the question, is it the preeclampsia during pregnancy that has caused damage that leads these women to develop these cardiovascular diseases later in life? Or were these women, even before pregnancy, did they have some sort of cardiovascular issue that predisposed them to getting preeclampsia and also predisposes them to getting cardiovascular and, and uh, disease later on in life? Well, here's a really nice study uh, from Christoph Leeds, Phil Bennett and, and their groups uh, looking at a cardiovascular function before pregnancy and who went on to develop preeclampsia or fetal, fetal growth restriction. And what they found is that women who subsequently went on to, to develop preeclampsia and fetal growth res, re, restriction had lower cardiac output before conception, had higher mean arterial uh, pressure before conception, and had higher total peripheral resistance before conception. It's a really strong indication here that at least some of the women who went on to develop preeclampsia and or fetal growth restriction were predisposed in that they already had a degree of cardiovascular impairment. What happens to women after they get preeclampsia? Well, I touched, touched on that a second ago. But interestingly enough, in the short term, there is also an increased chance of persistent or recurrent hypertension in, in the short time scale. So if you look at women a year after their pregnancy, when they've had severe preeclampsia, and if you just check their blood pressure in their office, you will find that a quarter of them have high blood pressure and very often missed because why do you follow up these women who are by and large young and healthy? But you should. And actually, if you do ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, so they're having their blood pressure checked throughout the whole 24-hour cycle, actually, you find that a lot more of them do have high blood pressure. 40% of them have hypertension. In 18% of them, it's mass. In 10%, it's white coat hypertension. But if you monitor them properly, you will find so the conclusion from that is, as I say, hypertension is common a year after experiencing severe preeclampsia. Does that matter? Well, it is, because my, you know, in, the, in the America, particularly the American studies of non-pregnant people, they have shown quite conclusively that mass hypertension and white coat hypertension are risk factors for later development of cardiovascular disease, ischemic, ischemic heart disease, stroke, and so on. So they recommend that ambulatory blood pressure monitoring should be offered to all women at, at risk of developing hypertensive uh, or cardiovascular disease. And that includes women who've had severe preeclampsia during their pregnancies. So at the very least, you should be following up these women. So, you know, 
when these women have preeclampsia and you send them out of your hospital and the blood pressure is settled, don't ignore them. These are women where there is a fantastic window of opportunity to pick them up and make sure that you can introduce monitoring and lifestyle measures that make a difference uh, to their long-term chances of developing cardiovascular disease. So when you're discharging these women, make a plan. Who is going to monitor? Who's going to follow up this woman's blood pressure? How often should it be monitored? What are the thresholds for reducing or stopping the antihypertensive medication? And what are the uh, indications for going to see her GP or primary care physician? So if a woman is discharged in antihypertensive treatment, they should have medical review in two weeks, either by yourself or by the GP or whoever. If they go home and they're already stopped their blood pressure medication, they should be seen six weeks down the line. And if they still need antihypertensive treatment after that, they should see a specialist, a physician, or somebody who specializes in hypertension. So the, the main message from this is, do not let these women walk out of your hospital and, no, and not uh, with no long-term follow-up arranged. These women need follow-up, so you're sure that they're okay. So my take-home messages from today are first, that if you can uh, categorize women as high risk back at the first trimester, they should be given low-dose aspirin taken at night. And it's got to be the first trimester because I said the ASPE trial said that it's got to be at least before 15 weeks, otherwise it's a waste of time. Triage women with suspected preeclampsia using PLP LGF and or SPLIT1. If you have access to these, they do make a difference uh, only before 35 weeks. Home blood pressure monitoring has a real place, I think, uh, nowadays in that there are huge advantages in terms of saving the woman cost and time and childcare and so on, saves the hospital a huge amount of money and effort and time uh, and uh, doesn't overdiagnose people with hypertension. And women who develop hypertension in pregnancy, they need to be followed up. Don't let them walk out the door without adequate follow-up in place. Thank you very much. for It's been a real honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patrick. It was a wonderful uh, lecture, which we have uh, witnessed history today. You being there virtually coming from United Kingdom. And it's really great. There are many questions which are being there. And I would like to take one by one. Uh, thank you. Uh, any expert comments from any one of uh, our esteemed panelists? The floor is open to all of you. Now, I think it was a wonderful, yeah. wonderful uh, presentation, Pat. And I think you touched upon, especially I love the slide of uh, uh, Dr. McGee's trial because, you know, it gives a very, very good idea instead of going high and coming back and adding something. I think that was a wonderful, and it was a wonderful presentation, no doubt about it. Thank you, so Thank you, Pat. And I think being from the Pregnancy and NCD Committee of FIGO, uh, I must say that your emphasis on a long, long term postpartum follow up is really, really crucial because we're trying to change the government policy here, which says only one postpartum checkup at 42 days and then she is lost in the population. So annual checkup for those who have had either hyperglycemia or hypertension in pregnancy for the rest of their life, tag her forever. That is the mantra. Yeah. I, I completely agree, Hima. And it's, you know, from the, a national point of view, it's hugely cost effective to do that because you prevent so much pathology down the line. Yeah. Thank um, you. Yeah. Patrick, excellent uh, lecture. And, uh, you know, you've brought out those slides and, you know, the importance of the sensitivity, sensitivity of all the tests very well, you know, very makes it very easy for practical understanding. I probably would just like to mention that. Uh, you know, we have uh, our organization, Gestosis, uh, we have the India chapter. And through the India chapter, we have developed a Gestosis score. And uh, Hema is very well aware of that. Uh, you know, it's uh, this is a score which will probably be useful in the low to the middle income group countries because we do it at, you know, the first time when a patient comes in, uh, one of our core committee members has developed the Gestosis app and we download it on the mobile phone. And from the mobile phone itself, you know, as soon as the patient comes and you're taking the history, you just ticky mark all the points. And if you get a risk score of three or more, we start the women on low dose aspirin. And uh, the maternal characteristics are, of course, taken into account. But there are some 16 factors that we are looking at apart from the age 
and the previous history of hypertension, history of diabetes. We're also looking at ART pregnancies and we're looking at the interpregnancy interval, history of PCOS and, you know, history of autoimmune problems. And keeping all that in mind, you know, we've designed a score, which is, you know, the, the lower ones get one, the middle ones get two and the higher ones get three. And then you, you total up everything. So the whole advantage of doing it, of course, we do agree with the aspirate trial and, you know, the first trimester scan, wherever possible, the women are going to go. But in many parts of India, the women are not probably able to access that first trimester scan. Probably the only scan they have is maybe the anomaly or maybe the 26 weeks, you know, which is not desirable. But then what we do is at least these women, they can be started off on the low dose aspirin. So if they don't even go for that first trimester scan, at least one preventive strategy has been, you know, administered at a very early age. And along with that, we're also giving her calcium, particularly from the low calcium resource group. So one to 1.5 grams of calcium and the low dose aspirin. And currently we have uh, uh, spoken to many centers and they are already validating the data. We're hoping that we have a good, you know, a good uh, sample size will be able to actually give you the results of the data. So this is something which we've been following. But I fully agree wherever possible, if they can be subjected to the first time scan, and, you know, we get the results here, yeah, 150 milligrams of aspirin uh, at night time, definitely. And I'm glad you emphasize the point night time because that is the best time for the, you know, the aspirin to act. And why 75 and why not, uh, uh, you know, I mean, why 150 and why not 81 or 75 as uh, I'm glad you cleared that doubt also. But I, I really enjoyed your slides and uh, excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks for that comment, Sutra I've, I've, I've heard your lecture before about the gestational score, and I think it's fantastic. It's really good, you know. And I'll be honest with you, you know, that, that sort of Kippers Nicolaitis model of the different factors, it, there's no way that's available in, in all hospitals here. Firstly, because not every, you know, most hospitals actually don't have PLGF testing still. Uh, uh, most hospitals, the first trimester scan is done by sonographers, and they don't have the skill to do first trimester uterine artery doppler. So I think that this is a model that, that, we kind of aspire to, um, and the, at the moment, most places are using the, the NICE guidelines and those, those criteria there. And I think your gestosis score is probably better than the NICE guidelines. Um, now, people say, people are very critical. Kipros is very critical of the NICE guidelines. You say it's so blunt, it's so inaccurate. And in a sense, that's true. Um, but on the other hand, it's not bad. It probably overcalls it. I said that 40% of people would be described as requiring aspirin. So it overcalls it, but at least it picks up most people who are likely to get preeclampsia. And to be honest, there's not much downside to taking low-dose aspirin either. So it's not perfect. And I, I think his model is infinitely better. But, you know, it's a practical tool, uh, just as you argued for the gestosis uh, score there. Right. It was very nice talk, Pat. Uh, I mean, uh, I think most of it is being discussed and talked about. The two points which I really enjoyed, I mean, the whole lecture was good, is like the postpartum thing, you know, like when you are giving them contraceptive advice, I think in that visit, we should put a red flag on the women who are going to be requiring, uh, you know, continuous care so that they can be, you know, picked up for future cardiovascular disease and in the future pregnancy, if they are going to be uh, getting preeclampsia again. So very, very nice lecture, very good slides and really, uh, you know, with good um, uh, evidences uh, of literature. So enjoyed your talk. I, lo I love uh, my, my yeah. colleague, David Williams, who's an, sorry, is an obstetric physician. He's with these beautiful articles about pregnancy as a stress test for life. In other words, for mm -hmm. example, with diabetes, you're born with a uh, hereditary predisposition to diabetes and then pregnancy temporarily unmasks that and it goes away after the baby is born. And then later in life, old age unmasks that again. And he argues exactly the same for preeclampsia. So you have this predisposition, as we were saying there, pregnancy temporarily unmasked it in the form of preeclampsia, then it goes away. And then later in life, you get your um, cardiovascular disease. So I really love, love that model. And he's got, he's got about 10 different um, medical conditions where he demonstrates that that's the case. Pat, um, wonderful talk. Uh, I have one um, suggestion for all the, uh, the Indian obstetrician gynecologists who are uh, listening to it, that when you are talking about the uh, postpartum period, try and link these patients with the immunization schedule so that the mothers always bring their children for immunization, get their BP check, get their sugar check, 
um, when they bring their children for immunization, especially the high risk one. And this is a golden opportunity to make sure that you, you postpartum women disappear in the Indian scenario, but they are certainly there for the vaccination. So catch them when they come for vaccination to check their BP and sugar to make sure that we take full advantage of the immunization schedule and the uh, maternal well-being. Yes, sir. Thank you. You have said the, the right thing that definitely when we talk about hypertension in pregnancy, we discuss it during pregnancy. But the, the message today is that the hypertension becomes a disease in the long term and we need to follow up the patient. This is really very, very important. And I think that is what we should be focusing more in India because we have a big burden of hypertension and most of the patients get lot, lost to follow up. And uh, rightly said by Dr. C. N. Purandare, the immunization and the postpartum period is the most appropriate period to catch this patient. So I think it was a real excellent uh, talk and a lot of uh, newer things and uh, you have highlighted uh, Dr. Pat and it was wonderful listening to you. Very nice slides and very clear. You know, it was really very informative. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh all of you, wonderful panelists, and for your comments. I also would like to take uh, one or two questions now, but before that, I would like to read the uh, comments which have come from all over India. This is Dr. Sumangala Devi Kozikode, very nice presentation. Dr. Kiran Sina from Kanpur, very nice and wonderful talk. Uh, Dr. Saubhagyavati from uh, Bihar, a wonderful, excellent presentation. Welcome, sir. Uh, well, there is. Uh, you have already answered the question of uh, Dr. Vandana Sangli. Uh, also, uh, she has asked about aspirin, which has to be taken. And there is one more question from her, from Sangli. Sangli is a small state, uh, small uh, town in uh, Maharashtra state. Uh, what is the pro positive predictive value of double marker test in PIH, Dr. Pat? Yeah. So if. Um if you do the Kipras Nicolaitis model, so let's, if I start with the, the, the nice guideline model, so the positive predictive, predictive value is really poor. In other words, I was saying it'll mark 40% of women as high risk, in other words, needing uh, dolus aspirin, but probably only a few percent, let's say 5% maximum will get it. So you can see how poor that is. Whereas if you use the Nicolaitis model, it's much more accurate than that. It's positive predictive value. And it depends. You've got to separate it out, as, as those figures showed. You've got to separate it out into the prediction of early onset preeclampsia, slightly later, and the late onset. So it's good. It's got a high positive predictive value at predicting preeclampsia below 34 weeks. A little bit less good between 34 and 37 weeks, and not very good at all at the later. But as I said in my presentation, it's the early ones that you really want to be able to predict, not so much the late ones. Thank you. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, Dr. Saubhagya K. Bhatt from Belgam. Belgam is in uh, Karnataka state. Uh, is there a proven benefit of uh, nitrous oxide donors in the management of PIH where the liquor volume appears to be normal? It's a very good question. Uh, no is the short answer. And more important than that, often the nitrous oxide donors, uh, the, the nitrous oxide donors have, have some side effects in terms of dropping blood pressure sometimes too quickly. So at the moment, at least, the evidence suggests that the, the risks outweigh the benefits, so probably better to avoid. Uh, well, this is Dr. Manindar Auja from Faridabad. Dr. Hema is right, follow-up tag for hyperglycemia and hypertension. So, well, uh, uh, we had this wonderful question answer session with Dr. Patrick O'Brien live from London, RCOG. And uh, Dr. Patrick, we are not going to leave you. You are going to be there still with us. And uh, mm -hmm. thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. And all of you who have been kind enough to spare their valuable time. I would like to now go ahead and start my panel discussion. And uh, with me, uh, we have the luminaries of Foxy who have been there with us. Uh, the, today, the panel discussion is on hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, and it's going to be uh, the panelists who are going to discuss and talk about the various case scenarios. So, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our esteemed panelist, Dr. Hema Devakar. As you are aware, she's the co-chair of the FIGO, 
NCD committee, the past president of uh, Foxy and the Bangalore Obstetric Gynec Society. Dr. Suchitra Pandit is the presently the current chairperson and the president of the ISOPA Mumbai chapter, and she was also the president of Justosis, uh, the president of Foxy and MOGS. We have with us Dr. Krishnendu Gupta. He is a professor at the Swami Vivekananda Medical College, and uh, he represents uh, uh, at AOFOG uh, the Foxy. He has been the vice president of Foxy also, and of course the current vice president of uh, Foxy, Dr. Archana Baser. Uh, welcome all of you, and we have expert comments with our esteemed guest, Dr. Patrick O'Brien. Uh, I request now Dr. Hema Divakar, Madam, to please go ahead with the case scenario. You can just read uh, it, Madam. The ball is yours. The <laughs> okay. So this, this case, is, uh, she is a primary, 26 years old, and has had an uneventful course till now under my care. Okay. And she's seen at 28 weeks, and her BP says 140.92. Does not have any other symptoms, no proteinuria as well. Next. Would you like to admit this patient? No. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Would you like to ask her about salt restrictions and bed rest? No. I like the short answer from Patrick, so I am following that trend. Short answer is no. <laughs> so, um, drugs for mild hypertension. See, again, I would like to recap the four take-home messages that um, Pat mentioned. One was the importance of point of care. That is the home monitoring. You know, with wonderful devices that we have, we can have an access to uh, the follow-up BP of this patient, uh, just 140.92, just one reading you've given me. So that's point number one. The second thing he emphasized was, Maybe if this patient had the luxury of having all the things done at 12 to 13 weeks and the prediction was possible, she may have been one of those candidates who may have been on 150 uh, milligrams of aspirin at night and she may not have moved on into, uh, you know, this also we cannot say that she's moving into preeclampsia, but she may have done better. So that's the second point. The third thing is, yes, if you can do PLGA, he said very clearly, in at an earlier gestation that is less than 34 weeks if you can do PLDF it's less than 12 then more likely so you are going to keep her more stricter watch on her because you have that suspicion lurking there that yes she may get into an adverse event and you may have to be more cautious more aggressive in your management of this case so having said that the um, ballpark is that if you Think of starting any antihypertensives. It was very, very clear. Thanks, Niranjan, for these simple questions because it allows us to reflect and recap on what Pat has already said because Laura's paper and the uh, algorithm of what antihypertensives would you choose and why. So the it took a long time for many of us to get the methyl dopa, alpha methyl dopa out of our pens because that was the only thing and right, left and center we were prescribing. And so slowly, yes, we did shift to labetrolol and nephidipine as number one and two. And then, okay, the third one, if it's needed, uh, methyl dopa. So that would be the uh, sequence here uh, as well. So I echo the same message uh, given by our esteemed guest speaker today that this is how uh, typically, this case I would have looked at. Yeah, mm. I think Thank I you, would Madam. appreciate Hema's comment of taking the alpha methyl dopa out of our pen pen habit. <laughs> yeah. it, it was really, really a task. Yes, <laughs> Madam, uh, if she was in labor, uh, would you mm. give her any other drug apart from this medications? You've asked specifically about magnesium sulfate. I don't think it would have been of much use to prevent the, if that's the reason why, you know, you're thinking you prevent uh, eclampsia, so you give magnesium sulfate, then maybe no. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, madam, uh, for that presentation. Uh, as you are aware, uh, there is no benefit from salt restriction or bed rest or sedatives in preventing the severe hypertension. Early initiation of antihypertensive is not effective in preventing severe hypertension or its consequences. And uh, well, antihypertensives could compromise fetal perfusion. So this is all important things we should be aware of, especially when we are dealing with patients who are just with mild uh, 
uh, hypertension. This is the famous trial. I would like to talk about McRae trial, and it was published in 2002. Uh, well, it was a multi-centric randomized placebo-controlled trial of 10,000 women, and uh, there was uncertainty about the magnesium sulfate uh, use. There was significant reduction in eclamptic weight, but number needed to treat is large for my preeclampsia, and there was no difference in maternal morbidity or neonatal outcome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Just one Dr. second, Niranjan. One simple basic point I want to park uh, for the benefit of yes. all the viewers here, because even a simple thing like taking a blood pressure measurement, okay, MAP, mean arterial pressure is what we say, and then with the electronic equipment, yes, it is you know quite clear. But with the mercury spectrometers, which are often used, and the right size of cuff, and the skilled uh, you know uh, staff nurse. Who is rightly or wrongly, and such volume of work, and there actually lies the root of the problem that many patients are not even uh, detected with a high blood pressure. So the word of caution for everybody: simple things as taking a correct blood pressure measurement has to be the skill of every single uh, team member and the staff working for your unit. Yeah. Thank you, Niranjan. Thank you. Thank you. Madam, you have to be there around with us with your expert. Comments along with Patrick, sir. Niranjan, may I can I make a comment, please? Yes, we... yes, yes, yes. Yeah. See, today we are looking at hypertension as mild, moderate is taken as non-severe, and severe, of course, you know, as the definition is one sixty hundred and ten. Anything about that value is taken as severe. So, in the mild to moderate, as very rightly Hima said, you really don't have to give the antihypertensive unless you find that there's a persistent BP of one forty. 90 or more on two occasions and if you find a you know a rise in the bp in the blood uh, in the opd and it's a busy opd you can ask her to wait back for about 10 15 minutes repeat the blood pressure look whether she's emptied the bladder whether she's had some tobacco you know in our opds we have women coming in chewing tobacco particularly in the public hospitals but in the private setups yes it's a little more different the atmosphere is different but wait don't immediately label her as an hypertensive Check her BP again. If it is still one forty ninety, yes, then that is taken as blood pressure, and then you can decide about what you want to do. But uh, you know, if we let them go away, if we have these, uh, you know, the gadgets, we have a lot of biomedical engineers who come up with beautiful gadgets where they can actually check out, you know, the blood pressure, and they also give you, uh, you know, a trace of the. Uh, Uh, the NSCs. So these are the combinations which are now available. So those can be used for domiciliary monitoring. Thank you, thank you, Doctor uh, Suchitra, Madam. Now I hand over the mic to Doctor uh, Sir Suchitra, Madam. Okay, yes. it's my. I'll be rather. Uh, so this is a 19-year-old primary gravida at 36 weeks of gestation. Poor lady, she's got married and immediately conceived. I think uh, she's had an uneventful antenatal course and. She has been brought in an altered state with a history of convulsion at home. Uh, in the labor ward, the blood pressure is two hundred and twenty by one forty, and she has already had three pluses of proteinuria. She is not in labor. Obviously, this uh, uh, this patient is she started convulsing, and uh, I am sure what you would really want to know is what is the next course of management and what should how should we really approach her. in the emergency room so i think first of all i would like to also uh, call for help as i'm doing my simultaneous work i would uh, give her a left lateral position put in an airway make sure that the oxygen uh, is uh, you know the nasal prongs are put in but i would simultaneously ask my uh, staff to get the maxself dose ready and i would prepare to give the loading dose of maxself which is 4 grams and Magnesium sulfate is a drug of choice for prevention and treatment of recurrent convulsions. So there are no two opinions. It's only Maxelf. And uh, today we recommend that everybody keeps a fifty percent weight by volume ampule of uh, magnesium sulfate because it's very easy to calculate the dose and very easy uh, to uh, you know, make the. And when we are running the clamp schedule, we actually get the staff and the residents uh, to uh, you know to prepare the doses. so the dose of maxel should be immediately ready and simultaneously when you're taking an iv line i would suggest taking iv line on both the sides on one side you can take the investigation and and on the other hand uh, we can start giving off the anticonvulsants 
a blood pressure is extremely high so i think in this particular case i would i would my drug of choice would be labetalol and uh, i also have nifedipine if by the time the labetalol is coming through i will uh, like to use nifedipine if the labetalol it takes a little time to get ready but i want to mention here again that it's never ever sublingual you never uh, you know like in the older times we used to uh, sort of put a needle into that max uh, into the nifedipine capsule and put it in sublingually we don't recommend that anymore and of course the investigations uh, simultaneously will be sending off the renal function test the liver function test the uh, cbc the coag profile the blood pressure and i would also like to do the serum electrolytes and uh, you know when you are looking at choice of an anti hypertensive agent in acute crisis today in in the city of uh, mumbai we have labetalol we have parenteral nicardipine we have introduced that into the armament arm it is the same family as nifedipine it can be titrated very easily and the big advantage is it's biosoluble so uh, we can titrate it and you can actually start this drug you know the nicardipine 5 mg uh, per hour as an infusion and every 10 minutes you can increase the dose to a maximum of 30 mg per hour so we found this nicardipine is a very very uh, important drug uh, because we are used to using nifedipine nifedipine of course uh, as i said it's only tablets we don't have a parenteral rule but labetalol yes this has been uh, i think the drug of choice the first uh, Parenteral ten to twenty milligrams IV, and then we gradually increase it. You can follow the Parkland regime or the Sibai regime. Usually, we follow you know the ten to milligrams, twenty milligrams IV. Then you start increasing the dose every twenty to thirty minutes, and finally, you maximum you go up to a dose of two hundred and eighty to three hundred milligrams, and keep that infusion for one to two milligrams per minute. But let me tell you that even with parenteral labetalol. you won't find that the bp suddenly drops down it will take its time so if you feel you want to give in and and you feel it's taking time you are uh, okay to give her even the oral nifedipine but if the patient is fitting obviously the oral will not be of uh, value in those cases we have used uh, uh, injectable nicardipine uh, hydrolyzine is a drug which we've kept only with absolutely you know when you're very very sure that the person who's monitoring that lab uh, hydrolyzine is very very careful because there can be a precipitous fall in the blood pressure and when you actually use hydrolyzine you should be prepared to take this patient either she's delivering normally or you take her to theater and you have to deliver her because there can be a lot of transient tachycardia and there can be a sudden acute cardiogenic shock if the hydrolyzine is not titrated uh, you know in the correct manner so usually if you're using hydrolyzine then it's 5 mg intravenous or intramuscular and you gradually very carefully titrate the dose and you can control that blood pressure and then take a decision of what you want to do now by this time we've given the maxel but we've also uh, examined we've done the uh, abc's we've checked the respiratory rate we've checked the reflexes the patellar reflexes and we've uh, catheterized her to check what the urine output is like if all that is fine we can continue with the loading dose of maxel now in many of the public hospitals it is the intramuscular the pitchers regime which is used 10 uh, grams of maxel that is 5 grams in each butter and uh, you clean the area very nicely you give a little bit of a uh, local and then you give the maxel but in most of the uh, you know, corporate hospitals and private hospitals it is infusion so the loading dose is the same uh 4 grams but given very very slowly over 10 to 15 minutes and then we continue with the 1 gram per hour infusion by the zuspans regime and we find that this works very well and many a times what happens is when you're giving this the loading dose i prefer that a doctor gives this loading dose rather than the nurse because it shouldn't be given fast so in many of the corporate hospitals sometimes if there is no helping hand at that time and you just have a staff nurse we put this in 100 ml of normal saline and give it very very slowly over the next 20 minutes so we find that magnesium sulfate is absolutely a wonderful drug and very rarely has it not worked i remember two or three instances at sign where the max self uh, was given and the patient still continued to converse and we realized that she was a case of cerebral malaria and the other time we found that she had a space occupying lesion a tuberculoma and then we had to you know get in other investigations and get the physicians involved but otherwise we found magnesium sulfate works extremely well not only does uh, it help to 
uh, stop the recurrent convulsions and it also you know gets a much more better maternal and perinatal outcome so i think these are the things lactic cocktail is something we have stopped using uh, i think when i was post graduate we were using it but the moment i came to uh, mumbai and sain hospital i think km and sain hospitals were the only ones using magnesium sulfate and we had a huge data and we had found that you know pre uh, max sulfira and post max sulfira there was such a significant difference in the maternal morbidity and uh, mortality and now we are, we are happy to say you know over the with the with the help of foxy with the help of the organization just doses and the you know the national eclampsia registry also pointing out so many lacune things are much more better yet in the private setup i'm surprised to see that people you know don't stock up their max self and many a times when the patient comes in they will give a dose of campos and then they will send the patient away to the bigger hospitals so i would uh, really re- request everybody to please you know keep this dose now you ranjan the question that uh, you brought up about this low magnesium sulfate personally i haven't used it at all but i know suman sardesai had uh, this particular paper published and she, all her postgraduate students and everybody would follow that she would give the standard dose of prichard's regime the loading dose that is 4 grams and then she would use a 2 grams every 3 hourly uh, the idea was because indian women are smaller weight wise even lesser and even uh, sibai had mentioned in his first paper on maxel that in the asian women the dose can be reduced so on the basis of that uh, professor sardesh i had done the study but it's a small study which is published so therefore on the basis of this i think we will still rely on the uh, you know the 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 collaborative eclampsia trial data again dhaka uh, they have uh, some experience of uh, doing the uh, you know the low dose uh, one important thing is if somebody is transferring a patient who is fitting please do give them an intramuscular dose of 4 grams of maxel so that during the phase of transfer at least she will not convulse and put in a proper transfer note put in a proper iv line if you can catheterize the patient and send her off to the uh, peripheral hospital but at the same time give a telephone call and let them know today because of the mobile uh, you know the communications is much more better so i think uh, this particular lady after i've given the max if i will examine her check what the cervical status is check what the per abdomen is if she is already in labor i would you know consider rupturing the membranes and giving her sintocin on uh, pitocin to encourage her uh, you know to deliver but obviously if the cervix is remote from you know the bishop score is very very poor i probably may even you know consider doing an operative intervention but i will stabilize her stabilize the blood pressure uh, keep a watch on the patellar reflexes the urine output and most of these patients do come around if she's had only one convulsion at home she will definitely come around the problems come if they've had 8 to 10 convulsions they sort of you know have multi organ problems and we've seen all those cases at sign you know then it becomes difficult to salvage them if you've given maxself and if the patient convulses within the next 15 or 20 minutes uh, you are justified in giving a 2 grams of uh, maxel funds more and again you can give this uh, as an iv dose a very very slow iv dose uh, d- you know dissolved in uh, uh, 20 ml of normal saline over 15 minutes and most of the times this conversion will abort thank you uh, dr suchitra pandit for that wonderful uh, uh, you know uh, insight of giving how to manage a case where you have to see that the patient doesn't have a lot of convulsion doesn't have recurrence of the convulsion how to go about and give her anti hypertensives what would you do if she had another convulsion again 2 hours after the iv loading dose madam yeah in this situation if she's had it again i'll first uh, you know reassess her role i can again give another 2 grams dose which is no problem at all provided i am happy with the patellar reflexes her respiratory rate this clinical criteria of the respiratory rate being more than 14 to 16 patellar reflexes being present and urine output being more than 30 cc per hour i think we are we are okay to give her a 2 grams dose once more but i'd like to mention here that you know even if the patient delivers or if the convulsion stop we must continue the maxel for 24 hours at least a minimum of 24 hours either post delivery or Conversion, whichever has been earlier, 
and despite this uh, uh, if the myself if she's still fitting and she's not yet delivered i probably would take her to the theater give her a you know incubator and deliver her diazepam may or may not be very helpful but there are cases when we have used uh, uh, sometimes we've used uh, diphenylhydantoin thank you doctor uh, so chitra what clinical pointer should prompt a ct scan in this case of an eclampsia I think if this patient is uh, conv- continuing to convulse, or she is remaining very, you know, uh, depressed, or she is not the arousal, the general when you are looking at the general condition, it's deteriorating. She has got a history of fever, and uh, I am finding that uh, you know the the parameters are not fitting into eclampsia. Probably, I would ask for a physician's opinion and get a CT scan done because the CT will then tell me whether you know she, there is something else that I am missing out. Like I mentioned, a cerebral malaria in India is is not not unknown. Uh, a space occupying lesion like tuberculoma or a cystic sclerosis, or even if she's going into something like a press syndrome, where I'm probably missing out. But the treatment I've already initiated, so I'm at least happy about that. Are there many effects of the neonatal outcome of magnesium sulfate? So in fact, we found that uh, the magnesium sulfate. you know it's very it's friendly for the babies because the babies uh, are not depressed i remember the cautekers regime of uh, diazepam and the lytic cocktail the babies used to be so depressed they would invariably end up going to the nicu but these are the babies on um, max you know they might even if there's a meconium staining we have uh, skilled birth attendants and we have neonatologists to take care of the babies most of the babies are doing very well and the apgars are much more better than on any other drugs and yes if i am today i'd like to say that in case we take a patient up for section in an emergency and she's a fitting patient who's not responded to magnesium sulfate then in those cases i would definitely tell the uh, anesthetist because you know max self and if they're going to give a muscle relaxant they'll have to reduce the dose of the muscle relaxant but if she is a patient who's responded to magnesium sulfate and i feel for an obstetric reason i'm taking her up for a operative intervention then a regional analgesia spinal is always better safer and you know our anesthetists are experts they can give the anesthesia the local anesthesia very very well because ga does have its uh, set of problems for any patient who is fitted you know the vocal cords can be quite edematous the neck can be short and if there is a wrong or a you know failed intubation then that can lead to other problems so usually we prefer regional but yes in a fitting patient we have, we have no other options you know we are giving them a ga but today you know the incidence of recurring convulsions is much more lesser from whatever studies we have seen i remember when i was working 20 years back 25 years back at sign we used to have this problem but over the time when people have realized the use of magnesium sulfate the incidence of these recurrent convulsions is lesser and lesser Dr. Niranjan has just okay. dropped. I think he should <clears throat> be joining in shortly. Yeah. Dr. Komal, if you could kindly take the proceedings ahead. Hi. Uh, well, there was some issue regarding my uh, MacBook. Uh, Doctor, uh, session. I would like you to sh- uh, please show the slides, please. Yeah. I request Dr. Krishnendu Gupta to please take over now and okay. uh, present. Thank you, Dr. Suchitra, for being there with us. Uh, before i take oh, it over i really uh, before i take over i really appreciate suchitra's comment about the mudalias regime which we were so you know happy giving the lightic cocktail when we were post graduates it was like and then we totally stopped it but it was thank you for you know it kind of rekindled my memory of manipal well uh, this case is a 34 year old uh, gravida 2 para 1 with uh, one living issue at 34 weeks of gestation seen at seat at the antenatal clinic with her blood reports the previous evening she had a bp reading of 140 by 90 mm of mercury and today the bp is 150 by 90 she has no proteinuria her platelet count is 50000 okay well uh, unless uh, some clinical findings are given we have to with the kind of a low platelets we are always extremely worried about 
that uh, we want to rule out whether uh, you know uh, she may be uh, going into uh, the help syndrome and uh, although this is uh, not classical but with the low platelets i think we have to make sure that her coagulation profile and everything is all right um are, are you going to give us any any findings niranjan yes yes please please go ahead you can uh, continue well so so uh, why uh, you know we we of course uh, the uh, the uh, blood pressure issue here is not you know nothing really uh, kind of extremely high that we are kind of uh, worried about but we have to think of hemolysis because the ldh levels are 600 oh my god that's that's extremely high uh, the normal is about 110 to 190 abnormal peripheral smear uh, okay the sgot is more than 70 so you have elevated enzymes again low platelets less than 100 and this was 50 so uh, of course if she comes with corroborative findings like uh, you know the other things of uh, severe preeclampsia or impending eclampsia like epigastric brain tenderness and of course uh, the dreaded uh, dic uh we have to be extremely careful in such a case so uh so i think we have to ensure that we have to treat them effectively and uh and uh, there is uh, i don't know whether it's uh, by uh, by chance or by coincidence that there was a very landmark study about the role of high dose corticosteroids uh, uh, high dose corticosteroids dexamethasone by j m o'brien and we have pat o'brien here and j m o'brien Uh, published a paper in 2000 in the american journal regarding this it was a landmark paper with three groups and he sh- he clearly showed that if you give doses of about 20 mg per day or more of corticosteroids 10 mg per day uh, 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 of dexamethasone 6 hours apart two doses and then repeating it definitely helped because what corticosteroids do it uh, not only improves platelet count it kind of reduces the liver enzyme abnormalities and more importantly it also pr- prolongs the latency uh, between delivery and uh, you know in a in a little dose dependent manner and so there's definitely a role of uh, uh, a high dose corticosteroids in in such patients and uh, as far as uh, you know maternal and perinatal mo- mortality is is concerned there's really no difference in maternal and uh, perinatal mortality at uh, uh, with these with these patients but uh, definitely Uh, we can definitely think of this high dose uh, corticosteroids in such women to bring down the uh, levels of the uh, liver enzymes and increase the platelet count to get a better outcome and niranjan anything else yeah session can you please uh, show the next slide thank you so much uh, dr oh, krishnendu it was short and sweet and uh, uh, it was wonderful for you uh, to be there Now we proceed with the case number four, and I request Dr. Archana Basir, Madam, please uh, read your case and your comments. At the outset, thank you, Niranjan, for giving me this opportunity. I really like the way you conduct these uh, meetings because you just focus on one particular problem, and and hypertension in pregnancy is one of the biggest problem, biggest challenge, and a fear in during. pregnancy so the case which i have in hand is a 30 year old primary gravida she has been delivered by emergency lscs at term and indication for her um cesarean section was abruptio placenti with severe preeclampsia four hours post delivery she has not moved of urine and the catheter is not blocked so i think here we are suspecting uh, you know if she hasn't made any urine so there is oliguria means maybe it may be uh, shut down as well so you have to really look into uh, uh, you know different things like if she is having a uh, like help syndrome or um, am i audible yes madam yeah and you have to keep in mind that maybe it's like a dry kidneys i mean there is no perfusion to the kidneys or maybe weight lungs like she might have because of she has abruption she had severe preeclampsia you have to see that her lungs are not loaded and she is not into the failure and uh, you have to give her a challenge of uh, mm, mm, diuretics and see if uh, she uh, puts uh, she throws some urine 
so um, when you are planning furosemide i think i would uh, it will depend upon the blood pressure what the blood pressure she has if the her blood pressure is quite low you have to give the lower dose of furosemide maybe i would start with 20 mg and depending on how uh, she is uh, doing we can increase uh, the dose of furosemide this is a very important decision to make whether you should insert a central line i think yes probably when we know that this kind of situations are there when kidneys uh, you you have a uh, post lcs oliguria to monitor it is it is important to put a central line and it, it is this kind of cases are invariably dealt in a unit with a multi speciality uh, ns that is should always be involved in care of such kind of patients and you should put a central line to monitor a patient better and the test there are various tests you need to look for dic because there is no obvious clinical uh, bleeding as uh, it is mentioned here so what you have to do is do her uh, uh, fdp uh, and uh, find out if there are you know like uh, clotting time bleeding time fibrin degradation products and um, uh, look for the dic is there anything else uh, niranjan uh, what test would you like to do for dic madam i would do in uh, my setup like we do the fibrin degradation product uh, you can see if this is high fdp is high and in, you know basically what you see is the there's a high increase in the bleeding time as well so patient is having a high bleeding time thank you uh, thank you so much now i request you to please read the next case as your case was very short and sweet uh, such cases also we have in our situation and this is one of them madam please go ahead yeah so uh, the next is uh, basically a 30 year old nali gravida who visits a clinic for pre conceptional counseling she is asymptomatic and her blood pressure is 160 100 mm of mercury i think this situation is becoming very common these days and our uh, women are becoming aware of pre pregnancy counseling so this women really needs to be investigated for hypertension why she is hypertensive so you do investigation you advise her routine uh, blood test especially blood urea serum creatinine and uric acid has to be advised what i normally advise such women is a renal sonography to see for her renal arteries as well that what is the cause of hypertension you will take the family history as well if there is a known um history of hypertension in the family and we really need to start her on anti hypertensive therapy because this um uh, anti hypertensive therapy and i do involve a physician in the care for such women those who are coming with a hypertension and um, you have to do their uh, renal function test as well and um, you have to really about the pregnancy outcome in such women you have to warn them that just yes, as i think what we gathered from the pat talk that if you already have a pre existing hypertension you are more likely to get pre eclampsia on top of it right. so that is what you real to emphasize that maybe i will correct your blood pressure pre pregnancy but when you become uh, you come to the pregnancy we we'll do her first trimester only screening for again a hypertension and pre eclampsia put a, them on high alert a frequent visit and maybe these are the candidates uh, you can start with a low dose aspirin during the first trimester of pregnancy because their likelihood of uh, having Uh, even the growth growth restricted babies and uh, pre eclampsia is pretty high and um, i don't think i mean uh, never come across a patient who i had to advise uh, to avoid pregnancy in chronic hypertension only situation when they had like a renal uh, problem and they had very severe proteinuria uh, that is like kind of a nephrotic syndrome hypertension leading to way back protein urea those are the women where i have advised them uh, avoid pregnancy and uh, um, would you advise her to undergo mtp um, i don't think i would advise mtp if she had only 150 100 blood pressure and she is 30 years of age we can very well control hypertension since she has 
um, come earlier on in the pregnancy we can start our anti hypertensive on our uh, in our daily daily practice we do come across women they are unaware of their blood pressure and they are pregnant so many women come across in our opds we are not advising them mtp we just control their blood pressure and i mean if uh, uh, and just compliance the patient compliance has to be very good in such cases so i think per se i will not advise them to go for mtp unless the renal functions are very badly affected niranjan niranjan you are muted uh, yeah yes yes absolutely yes madam yeah, without your permission i can't start na no? no no please go ahead <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks ranjan while, while i agree 100% with everything that uh, archana ji said today is the day of discussion for hypertensive disorders and we are all hyper about it and all the um, you know the cases are also going on uh, the lines of what if you know the blood pressure is high etc etc but i really really urge all the clinicians that we can't look at a pre pregnancy care only with chronic hypertension in a silo because when the patient is available to you for a pre pregnancy care there are a couple of other things also we should not miss the bus or lose the opportunity as in her bmi and also her glycemic status and of course the major organ the all whether already they have been affected etc whilst on one hand um, nirajan we grumble that we don't have an opportunity for pre pregnancy care Uh, when these are the kind of uh, patients and also the infertility group who will per se seek uh, the pre pregnancy care and we must do everything that is possible and also for this patient moving further again focus on the inter pregnancy care as well you know so this continuum has to always always be uh, kept in mind and a comprehensive look at everything that is happening to this patient because other comorbidities also if they coexist then the case on hand becomes uh, you know much more complex for the clinician to uh, handle and we need time and we need to pay attention yeah thank you thank you dr hema madam uh, wonderful discussion we are having and it's really great now i request dr patrick o'brien to please read his case and we will have a wonderful discussion on that this will be our last case okay well thank you very much so 35 year old prime gravida comes to labor ward blood pressure 200 over 110 for the first time with one episode of convulsion at home so it's looking like eclampsia uh, no history of preeclampsia or chronic hypertension received in the post ictal phase so i'm not sure if she's still pregnant or not but you know at first uh, observation it looks like severe preeclampsia and eclampsia regardless of the absence of a previous history post delivery when the mri was done it had a vasogenic edema on the parietal occipital subcortical white matter okay so this this looks like press p r e s um i really like this name because it tells you everything that you need to know about this condition Uh, so it's an encephalopathy, in other words, damaging the brain. It used to be called leukoencephalopathy because it used to be thought that it was just white matter, but actually it's it's not. It's grey matter as well. It's posterior, so it's an occipital and sometimes parietal, and it's reversible, particularly with uh, cause uh, cases caused by preeclampsia. They nearly all get better, completely better. Um, so that's the diagnostic uh, criteria. It's it's, an, it's diagnosed by MRI, but you can have a pretty good idea. from the clinical features which is basically it looks like preeclampsia but visual symptoms as well which can be hemianopia or blindness or absence of awareness so they their physical vision seems to be okay but they um um are not aware of what they're what they're looking at and it's a cortical uh, blindness if it happens um it can be diagnosed on ct but mri is uh, is the main diagnostic um tool Uh, yeah, so it says here the pathophysiology poorly understood. There are kind of two main uh, theories, really. One is the vasogenic, in other words, because because it's often associated with with high blood pressure um, outside of pregnancy or preeclampsia, um, that the uh, blood pressure uh, breaks down the sort of blood brain barrier. There's endothelial damage, damage, damage to the vasculature and uh, cerebral edema, and it seems that the posterior part of the brain is. is more vulnerable to this than the anterior part which is why you tend to get it there so that's the kind of vasogenic 
um, um, theory. And there's also, it can be also following treatment with various drugs like um, tacrolimus or some chemotherapy drugs, uh, or interestingly enough, after a bone marrow transplant, about one in 12 people get it after that. And, and here they think that maybe it's more direct damage to the endothelium that leads on to the same final common pathway. Um, but usually it, it's, it's something that you can see in preeclampsia. And of course, the features are similar to preeclampsia in that you've got headache, uh, you've got hypertension, um, and you've got perhaps confusion, perhaps other neurological symptoms. But then the key thing that, that gives you give this away are the kind of much more severe visual symptoms than you have just with preeclampsia or eclampsia. Next. <clears throat> Sir, uh, can you explain this uh, radiological characteristics? Yeah, so I mean, it's diagnosis, as I say, on, on CT, it gives you, you get hypo, hypo uh, echogenic areas towards the posterior part of the brain, the occiput uh, and parietal lobes. But really, it's diagnosing on MRI, uh, and in those areas, you tend to see a sort of hyper, an increased intensity signal from those areas. There can be. Um, uh, it can affect other parts of the brain as well, but if, if it is affecting other parts of the brain, it's just wise to keep a more open mind because that wouldn't be typical. Um, and also bear in mind that, you know, if, this, if you've got preeclampsia, there's also the possibility of a hemorrhage, a brain hemorrhage into the same area. So make sure you're watching out for that, particularly if the symptoms don't seem to be resolving reasonably swiftly. Yes, thank you. Uh, support, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, so, so the management, the yeah, sorry. So the management, um, so you've got general measurements, sort of ABC measurements, of course, uh, measures, of course. And then um, treatment very similar to preeclampsia, of course, the antihypertensives, anticonvulsants, magnesium, watching your fluid balance, and then correcting the underlying cause. So in our case, it's, it looks like the underlying cause is, is preeclampsia. So you um, manage the preeclampsia, as I said, uh, and then, you know, consider delivering the baby as you would just with somebody with severe preeclampsia or eclampsia. If it's another cause, like somebody, you know, taking tacrolimus or something, stop the treatment that's causing it. So, so it's basically supportive therapy, manage the underlying cause, which most times for us will be the preeclampsia, and that might involve uh, delivering the baby. Yeah, so there's a whole range of treatments that you can use, but fundamentally, in our situation, we'll largely be using um, the, the same drugs that we use for managing severe preeclampsia and eclampsia. And a large proportion of these patients, so you've got, if you've got preeclampsia and in developed press, probably about, in our country, at least about 50% of these women will end up in intensive care. But the good news is that they tend to resolve pretty quickly. Um, so the, the clue is in the, the name, reversible. And even, I mean, it can be a terribly scary thing. You can imagine somebody has a seizure and then they're blind. It can be terribly scary for the person and for the clinicians, but virtually always the rule, especially when the cause is preeclampsia, the rule is that it's fully reversible. Sometimes within just a few hours, nearly always within a few days. And as I mentioned, if, if it hasn't resolved, if, if the um, blindness, for example, or hemianopia haven't recovered within, you know, 48 hours, it's well worth repeating the imaging just in case they may have a, a brain hemorrhage that's developed even since then. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Patrick O'Brien. Uh, it was a wonderful discussion done by all of you. At the end of this program, I would like uh, each one of you to give one-liners regarding hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, that message you would like to give to our delegates. And I would like to tell you, we have a record attendance today, 2,119 2 members being logged in. So it is an amazing feature uh, being a weekend here. It's really great. I would request now and start with Dr. Hema Divakar to give her one liner, followed by Dr. Suchitra, Krishnendu, Archana, and of course, the last but not the least, from Dr. Pat. Yeah, uh, thank you again, Niranjan. Uh, I agree with all the distinguished speakers and the audience that 
this was a very delightful evening and we've enjoyed that. My one liner is that still the preeclampsia PPH are the prime killers uh, in our country. They rank very high on the list. So we really, really need to pay attention to all the little details that were deliberated today because it is not one off or once in a blue moon kind of a situation. This is a real thing, especially in the rural India where there are no facilities for MRI. Every time I'm called into the government meeting to discuss the maternal mortality, then there are many doctors saying that, uh, uh, hey, after preeclampsia, then she went blind and, you know, we didn't know what to do. And then we to uh, transfer her to one center after another center with incomplete notes because they're scared too, you know, because uh, somebody may blame them for not doing the right things. And uh, they so uh, all these things every clinician needs to know and network with the higher centers as well because many of the small the mama and papa nursing homes that we call in our country do not have access to uh, the MRI etc so this was uh, was also on the last case the point very well driven be cautious not to be scared so this is more than a one-liner but thank you for the opportunity thank you <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Uh, Niranjan, yeah, I probably would uh, sort of reiterate what Hema says. You know, early diagnosis of preeclampsia. So screening is very, very important. Please use our gestosis score wherever, you know, you're in a slow resource settings. Please use gestosis score because at least you'll have started off the treatment. Early registration of women, women are still coming late and a strict surveillance, timely delivery and max self, max self and max self. Prevent that conversion. Yes, Dr. Krish. Well, uh, as you said, one liner, mild hypertension, no salt restriction, no bed rest, and no sedition in the hope of preventing severe hypertension. That was too good. <laughs> Archana. Yeah. My one liner is uh, identify the cases of preeclampsia in time. And if you are not having multi speciality and you know the this is going to be a problem, do on time transfer to the higher center or multi speciality to prevent the morbidity, mortality, and press syndrome. Or yes, timely transfer is identify and timely transfer. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Archana. Uh, well, we have many questions which are there, but uh, we have to understand the importance of time. And we have a guest from uh, UK, Dr. Pat, who is being there with us for last uh, nearing more than two hours. Uh, any questions are there, we'll get back to you and we will write by email. Thank you so much, all of you being there with us. Niranjan, we'd like to know Patrick's uh, take-home message. Yes. But one liner by Patrick. Yes. yes. <laughs> the the one okay, and only. So my one will focus not on the preeclampsia itself, but before and after. So I would say screen at the start of pregnancy using the gestos gestosis score or whatever you want, but screen, comma, still the same sentence, comma, prevent for the first time in our history. We have something that we show can prevent preeclampsia, that's low dose aspirin. And then when you've, you've treated their preeclampsia and you're saying goodbye to them, don't forget to follow up. Excellent. Yes. That's Thanks, was too good. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Van. And, and you, uh, you have added and to disturb everything. Good seeing you, Pat, again. Yes, it was very nice very sum much. up of everything. Mm -hmm. And I would so like to enjoy the day. Yeah. Thank Niranjan, you. Pat, like... you're back. Thanks yes, to I'm Niranjan and so Pat. We all deserve a Pat. So now I, I, I request Dr. Komal Chawan to please Pat all of us by giving the vote of thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. I think it was the most learning and enriching session discussion which we had. Really, really a great discussion. And uh, uh, I really thank all those who have logged in. I think it was a record number of viewership. So thank you everybody who are there till the very end listening to this very important discussion. And this uh, session would not have been possible without the presence of the esteemed faculties. The chief guest, Dr. C.N. Purandare, our esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Patrick O'Brien from Vice President RCOG. So uh, really, it was a great talk and a great take-home message and a real short and crisp messages you have given us. So 
there, there will be an easy reminder to you the way you have told us so whenever we see any harris patient these messages would be already there in our mind and short messages what to do like it it is in a very brief manner you have conveyed thank you very much for making it so simple this difficult topic and the very esteemed panel which we had all the senior stalwarts dr hema divakar madam who is a representation from figo and we are really blessed that madam was here and she has participated so enthusiastically from the ncd committees of figo and has uh, uh, given her inputs in this panel and they were so valuable dr suchitra pandit madam who has worked under multiple organization aiccr cog gestosis ixopab and also our very own proxy and she has also put in her input the gestosis score and that was real fantastic dr krishnendu sir he is a professor and a great teacher and the way uh, the, the experience the vast experience he has in this subject he has made for the all difficult things sound so simple so definitely thank you so much sir for your valuable contribution we yes, have legend. discussed the case, cases that was really very very uh, thank uh, very very uh, very very fabulous and thank you very much archana baser madam and all the esteemed panelists and dr niranjan chavan the moderator who was with you all and who has been really very active in uh, this uh, planning of this entire program i thank you very much all of you i thank mcure our pharma partners who have brought us together with this platform of pog science integra team subu session and all of you who have worked towards sharing knowledge and sharing knowledge on a focused topic of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy so me from proxy medical disorders in pregnancy committee extend a warm gratitude to you and have a very good evening in india and a good weekend for everybody thank you so much namaskar thank you thank you bye bye thank you bye bye thank you stay safe stay safe bye 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 thank you bye 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 thank you